Boom, boom, boom. Another Kickstarter week. Boom, boom, boom. It's Chris from Leech Games. Let's do this now. Let's do this now. Let's do this now. Let's do it. The roundup for this week. What games are out there? What do you need to know about them? And plenty of commentary from yours truly. Because otherwise it just wouldn't be nearly as fun, right? <laughs> Uh, I put out a little bit of a quick blurb of selling tips and tricks and my own personal thoughts on it earlier this week. Tomorrow, as always, will be the upcoming video for the following week, which is going to be another big one and is even going to be bigger the week following that. And today is day 12 of the Grassroots Campaign tweeting at Simon and day 6 tweeting at Monolith. Grassroots Campaign there too from Mythic Battles Ragnarok. Still... As of the time of filming this, zero and zero. But I'm having fun while I'm doing it. So why not? Okay, let's take a look. Too much blabbing. Oh, yeah, you know, Patreon, Patreon, blah, blah, blah. Click, click, subscribe, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Uh, blah, 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 blah. You heard it all before. 1815, Scum of the Earth, Waterloo. Encapsulated by Hall or Nothing, Tristan Hall's latest game, the third in the trilogy, three times its funding goal. It launched last Friday, sort of that tweener zone of when I'm putting out videos but have already recorded them, so I thought I'd cover it. The first one here. What do you need to know? Two-player, asymmetric, 1v1, war, direct conflict type of game. It is apparently cross-compatible with the previous two, as it says here, historical epic battle system card game series. If you are passionate about war games, but passionate about card games, and the Venn diagram between the two of them is essentially a game like this. With the Hall or Nothing side of things, with all of his production that he has done, the artwork is fantastic. The quality of the production is fantastic. Consequently, you're going to usually pay for it as well. So this is definitely a case of you are going to pay for what you get. Because it's $45 for a card game. Say what you will. It's a lot of money for a card game. It, it just is. But he's put enough out there that you either know enough about the pedigree that you're getting into, enough of the design, enough of the previous history that it's either going to be for you or it's not. $82. That's pretty expensive playmat there. 30 euro playmat. So that's expensive. I won't, I won't kid myself. You're getting weather deck expansion for all three games there. And then pretty much everything that there is. Of the whole series. The 1066 Tears of Many Mothers, the St. Elmo's Pay, and Scum of the Earth. And everything that goes along with them. Which, all in all, it looks like it's about $85-ish per game for the playmat, the promo packs, and the expansion divided evenly. So like I said, I mean, the artwork is second to very few with the quality that goes into this game. And you're, like I said, you're paying for it. 36 event cards, 14 objective cards, unit cards, tactic cards, attachment cards, frontier cards, tokens, 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 and, of course, solo rulebook, if in case you really want to do solo instead. The interesting thing about this is they're actually also allowing for up to four players if you have more than one base set. So if you own two or now all three of these games, once this comes out, you can play with four instead of just two. The other thing that makes this game a little bit set apart is, as he says here, Every arresting card is inspired by a real person or event from that time. This is very tactical in nature in this card game where you were either playing as the Duke of Wellington or you were playing as Napoleon leading up to their clash at Waterloo. Now, these cards look a little bit busy, but a lot of that is really flavor. If you look at the amount of text at the bottom when you actually take a look at it, the actions are relatively straightforward. The stats are relatively straightforward. It's just they put a lot of detail into the background. And I think, again... You're paying for that historical emphasis, the historical work that went into it as well. And this is not just a simple, I form my army, you form your army. There are variety of obstacles that he calls as historical achievements that you have to overcome in order to make it to the battle in the first place. It's also very clear when you're looking at the rules, he spells it out on the exact first page saying, there's three ways you win. One, you destroy two of the frontiers of troops at the final battle. Two, you beat their leader. Or three, the other person just runs out of cards in their deck. You know, the old classic, you run out of stuff, I win scenario. And otherwise, it's relatively straightforward. Going back to those objectives that I mentioned, they're in alphabetical order. So you have to do them in a certain order on each side. How you are able to do them 
is the crux of the game. And once you complete all yours, if you are the first one to complete all yours, you can then start damaging and attacking those frontiers that I mentioned. And if you're going to be the first one to do that, you're going to have a much better shot at winning, obviously. Here you can see just a short glimpse of what the actual layout is. You can see the frontiers that he uses as the three main battle points of Waterloo right there, the ones that you're trying to destroy. Each player has their own pile of objective cards, the British cards over here, the French cards over here, and that is the pile you're trying to get through as I just talked about. And just like any other card game here, it comes with your classic phases, preparation, deployment, frontier, and objective. Again, relatively straightforward phases when you're reading through what you're actually doing. It also goes through very briefly, like I said, those cards, they look busy, but they're relatively straightforward. Cost to play, zeal, might, health, boom, that's it. And sometimes you got to deal with the type, but it's all relatively intuitive when it comes to the cards themselves. There's a lot going on with what you can do, but it's more in the tactical nature. So you're not having as much overhead in learning how to play when you look at this rule book. This is not a extremely dense rule book having read through most of it at this point. I, I want to say thank you because it also does not use overly complicated terms or making terms that are not as intuitive as I have seen the tendency to be lately in said such card games. I like that, that I'm not constantly trying to refer to a glossary or an index of, okay, what was that term again? Which, which one was this? And wh why is it not like this named that? way you know what i mean but that's a small thing that goes a long way now is it worth 45 dollars? that's i mean that's the question these games you know they don't come to retail really widely at all so as with all of his games they tend to be more expensive on the secondary market like killforth has been that way pretty consistently if i'm recalling my historical dollars and senses sensibly but that's the risk you pay you're going to get the product first. You're probably going to get the product at a little bit of lesser of amount, sort of a la like leader games, because their distribution, unlike leader games, it, it just isn't that large as, as them. It isn't that popular. And so there's not even a chance you're going to be able to pick it up extensively in the second market. There just isn't. So there's enough info out there about how these other two games played. And this is just adding n a few new nuances to the system that you can take a look at between the rule book the how it plays here as well as reviews and videos of the other two games as well that there really should be no question of whether or not uh, this game is for you in the sense that you should be able to know what it plays like and how it plays so from that aspect it should be relatively straightforward now it's not for me it's not for me but it's quality if this is sort of your sort of thing you know what to expect so that is 1815's come to the earth the battle of the inferiority complex i mean napoleon bonaparte Next up is something, again, I've never heard of, Foul Play, a murder mystery card game? Almost twice its funding value? Let's check it out. So this is an interesting game. Again, I've never heard of this before checking this page out. I'll say one downside, having skimmed this page already, they make you go to their website to get the rules and the full information about how to play it. And what you're doing is two to five players. It's a relatively straightforward game where you're either playing as a good cop or a bad cop, and they each have their own sets of rules. And what you're trying to do is find out, as I said, it's sort of a who done it. The good cop is trying to actually find the correct suspect. They need to find the three clues with the face down cards that are presented as evidence in front of you. And then they need to have the suspect card in hand before they can make an accusation. The bad cop has to create enough evidence to frame one of the various figures in order to win. So here is the basic setup, and what you're doing is just playing a card and then discarding a card, hence the piles. Playing a card is going to give you a various action or get you a piece of evidence. You're trying to get these three evidence pieces that line up, whether you're the good cop or the bad cop, in order to get the suspect. Now, if you make an accusation, especially as the bad cop, someone can block you and steal your card. So there's that that you also have to be aware of, even when you play your card in the first place. It seems relatively straightforward. It's not going to be super strategic. It just looks like a light, fun card game. If you get in on this soon enough, maybe there'll still be a $10 pledge left. Because, I mean, that's a, that's a cheap card game. No matter even if the shipping is a couple bucks. And it's 13 bucks at the higher level. I mean, that's a great price for a card game. It, it is. How good is it? I think that's the question. There's plenty of other higher levels that you can get their previous game as well. So it, it's really something relatively straightforward. A bunch of actions, a bunch of suspects. 
a bunch of evidence. So they talk about the fact that it was made first in the pandemic with the first version. This is actually more of a second edition because they sold locally over a thousand games in the first eight weeks. So it's a light mystery whodunit-esque game that seems to be a little bit different than the other stuff that's out there. So if this interests you at all, I think it's worth definitely checking out. It's something that's definitely flown under the radar and it's definitely indie. Check it out. Follow play. Next up is Malta Besieged, the deluxe edition. This is a solo solitaire World War II style game. Now, it says playable in an hour. That's a long solo game, at least to me. I'm not going to talk about this one that much because this is heading into rarefied uncharted territories on the League of Games channel where you're really talking about more of the war game side of things because you start throwing terms around North Africa, Desert Fox, Africa Corps, seeing a board like that. Oop. <laughs> I'm out. But it is a deluxe version of this game so there's not a lot of question about what the gameplay actually is it's just trying to make it a little bit better from that side of things and so you can check it out very easily there's how to play with the draft rules right here i'm not going to go into that because i'm not going to do it due diligence and there's reviews out there already as well on video side of things but also on board game geek so you just need to go check it out for yourself and 59 dollars for war games I think that's about right. I think that's a little less, but I don't quite know. So someone else in the comment section can correct me. It looks like you can get a copies of their other previous games as well. So uh, <laughs> there you go. I have absolutely no idea, but I don't want to do it poorly. But I also want to mention it that it's doing really well for a solo game. It's already at 41,000. I mean, that's, that's impressive. Solo war game. There you go. Malta Besieged. So I'm going to mention this one just because I think it's kind of a cool concept and I'm a sucker for dexterity games. I don't know if it's going to fund. It's only got five backers right now. It's got a month plus to go and it needs almost $4,000. So I mean, it's 20% of the way with five backers. So you only need 25 people in theory S, but it's Arma, a handmade wooden dexterity board game, but it's handmade. So you can see that some of these prices over here, well, that one's a little higher, but some of these base pledges even are like $600. And I think there's one person getting the board game of $600 right now. And there's a couple other smatterings at the lower levels. Even $340 for it and $300 for the base is really the lowest level. And so I just don't think it's really sustainable at that level. I mean, it looks like a great game, but that's a ton of money to spend on something like this. So what are you doing here? It's simple, right? You have to hit a peg or you have to hit another player's disc on every flick. But you have to make it around the whole track five times in order to win without being knocked off. That's what you're trying to do. And you can see an example right here. It looks like fun. It looks like pitch car on a closed track that you can do bumper cars with. So, I mean, I think the concept is great. I think the price is just way out of the league for someone like myself. So, I don't know if it will fun, but it's kind of a cool concept. So, I thought I'd mention it. So, check it out if it's of interest to you, though. Immunio. I talked about this one last week as well. It's just over 10% of its funding goal. I mean, it's golf, the card game, uh, done with special actions and special powers. That's essentially what it is. I took a look at it uh, last week in terms of the rules and everything. So you have your, just your helpers, your bacteria, and your special bacteria, and it's straightforward otherwise. We'll see what ends up happening with it. Uh, if you're not familiar with the golf, the card game, you have anywhere between four and six cards in front of you where the cards closest to you are the ones that you can look at and know what they are and the ones on the back row or the ones that are slightly further from you from your play area are the ones that you don't know and you are just taking cards either from the top of the discard pile or from the top of the deck and choosing to use them to replace one of the other cards that you have sometimes knowing what that card is but sometimes blindly replacing one of the ones in the back row which could be good it could also be detrimental and that's the concept in a nutshell just add special powers and some take that because otherwise the base game of golf, just with a deck of cards, a normal 52 bicycle set of cards, there's not a whole lot of interaction. It's multiplayer solitaire. So this is hoping to take that to a slightly different level. That's it. I don't know if that's enough to entice people. It's only $14 though, not much more than the other card game I mentioned. Although the other one is a little bit more appealing because you kind of can play most of this game with a 52 card deck. I don't know. I don't know if it's a unique enough concept to make people want to pay for it, at least at this point. So we'll see if it funds, but I wouldn't be surprised either way. Crawl out. Speaking of solo games I've never heard of, solo dungeon card game. 
<laughs> it's already funded, right? Only a $119 goal. It's at $194. So congratulations on that. I like that. Fun <laughs> funded, funded in five minutes. I'm sorry. It's probably pretty exciting though. I mean, that would be me if I did a game, right? I'd have like a $100 total and I'd be like, yay, I reached $100 in 10 hours. <laughs> so, I mean, it's basically taking like pixel type art uh, using dice and doing it in a solo game where you start with random three heroes of the total of 25. You recruit new allies, turning foes into party members and doing all sorts of other fun stuff, including like things like a warlock and a necromancer. When they join their party, you get to use their actions and their skills. It's not, it's nothing complicated, folks. It's nothing super deep. And what you see is what you get. I mean, the symbology is exactly just that. You're not paying for graphic design with this game. You're just playing because it maybe looks like fun to you. Basically, straightforward. Here are the rules. There's not even a rule book. It's just going through it. Drawing, rolling, assigning that D6 to an ability, and then taking actions uh, one card at a time on the party. And then doing damage. Uh, if there's any bad guys left, they hurt you. Victory, defeat. If you beat all the dungeon cards and the deck cards, you win. If you don't, you lose. Cat timeout. Buddy, you can't be up here, sweetie, okay? Okay, I love you, but you can't be up here. If you want to sit on my lap, you can. Okay? Okay, cat time in. It just looks straightforward. So what you see, again, uh, like I said earlier, is what you get. And whether or not this is worth the risk, you know, does it look simple? Yeah. Does it look easy to get to the table? Sure. Is it going to be deep? Are you going to play this numerous times? I don't know. I think it depends on you as a person. So cat interference here. Um, <laughs> people were wondering where the cats were. Well, I left the door open and you see what happens. Anyway, let's see. What's the price point here? Yeah. 15 bucks is the pdf and an exclusive card and let's see is that the lowest nope and interesting the other the interesting thing about this is as i'm looking at the pledge levels it's just a pdf there's no printed copy and so i think maybe that's something unique so you can get in at three dollars and it's just every pledge level above that you get to get custom cards based on what you want for the game to look like so here you get one here you get five and here you're getting you know whatever you want essentially at that level so i don't know for three bucks it's probably worth checking out. I mean, it's a PDF of a card game. If you're a solo player, hey, why not? That's crawl out. Loki, knock it off. There is just all sorts of indie type stuff coming out this week. And I'm going to just throw them all in here because that's what you come for, right? The more the merrier. Monster Rumble, two player, massive destruction, Godzilla esque monster game. <laughs> Fast moving with a ferocious bite and razor sharp claws. <laughs> that That's like better than I could ever do on drawing. So that's why I laugh on that because I can't even do that. So it looks like you're gonna be possibly printing your own thing here. What do we got going on here? I have no idea. So this game is already almost funded and I've read through the page now like once or twice and I have no idea how you're actually playing. They talk about it that you're doing a Kaiju inspired games. So you've got basically the Godzilla and the Blob fighting each other here. A box copy is gonna be 28 bucks, but you can also get just the STL files and do it for 10 bucks, and they just run through what's in the box. Two measuring sticks, lizard monster, all these other accoutrements, and a full color rule book, and you can kind of see here what they look like printed. Uh, so you can kind of see what you're actually going to be looking at as an end product. And they just say there's three different ways you can do it. One of them is a campaign mode. They give a little setup here of a practice campaign, but they don't actually say how it works. They just mention that different army units have different attacks, Multiple units of the same type concentrate. They can get a bonus. That's that's it. That's all they that's all they say about the gameplay. So I have absolutely no idea, and I have no idea why eleven people are backing this right now. But clearly, it strikes home with eleven people. So check it out if you like printing your own stuff and board gaming, and you have a three D printer and some time to spare. Monster Rumble? Huh? Huh? Okay. 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 Here's we'll get to the main stuff. Here's Floriferous, something that I recognize, something that I talked about previously. That is already almost three times its funding goal. Flowers, three different types of uh, ways that you're gonna be using them and types that are in the game. It's a set collection turn-based card game. It's a relatively light, lower complexity, lower overhead style card game. I swear that it seems to be like flowers in nature are the go-to Cthulhu theme of 2021 because I'm seeing it pop up all over the place. It's slowly gonna phase Cthulhu out, I guess, until we get like Cthulhu flowers or something 
Anyway, so you're getting an early spring expansion for free, and that's the main reason you're going to be backing this on Kickstarter, because that is the one thing you're getting. Again, $20 for a price point. Shipping is 8 bucks. $28 for a, a game shipping and a mini expansion with the higher level quality than several of the other card games we've seen. Again, it's probably a fair price. I'd say it's, it's about what I'd expect, especially including shipping. That's that's relatively pretty good. Again, $40 will get you two. So in case you want to give somebody a copy, you're going to get a discount there. Again, it's not going to be a difficult game of how to play. It's very simple, like I explained last week. You're picking a card. You're moving the pawn to that column. Then it has sort of the King Domino-like effect. And so what you're doing is you're trying to pick out cards that are part of collections for points or cards that determine which sets that you're going to need because there are various aspects to this game that I mentioned in terms of the different types of cards and that will affect the end game scoring. Going back to what I said about the King Domino is based on where your little meeple guys are at, the ones at the top go first when they pick from the next column over. So just like King Domino does. Then you take that card, move your guy there, rinse and repeat. You've got a five by five for the first round. You set up the five by five for the second round when your pieces are all the way at the other end. Then instead of going from left to right, you go right to left. Then you go left to right one more time and the game's over. Now the rule book is 20 pages, but that's because about a third of it is the solo game and just talking about the flowers here at the end. So it's not a high overhead game. Here you can see an example of what I was talking about. Left to right, right to left, left to right, game end. Boom. Here are the other card types that I mentioned. The arrangements, so based on your collection. The sculpture cards are just worth points, depending on who collects the most of them. So if you have the most, you're going to get the points. If you have the second most, zero points. Desire cards, worth points at the end of the game. Again, based on your collection. And then the bounty cards, based on your player collection as a whole. And then there's also stones, which just get you points at the end of the game as well relatively straightforward you know again what you're getting and i think there's something to be said of a game like this and the price point is about right for what i'd expect they offer the chance to get a couple of their other previous games as well so take that for what you will again there's no question about why it's funding and why it's where it's at just a quality product so that's flurry for us heads will roll no idea about what this was roll out chunky metal skulls flicking pocket dexterity game i mean right Reading the rulebook, it's relatively straightforward. You take your pieces, you chuck them on the table, you have a shield, you want your shield to hit this little treasure box. If your shield passes between two skulls of the same color, zoom, like goalposts, if you will, on the way to the treasure chest, you get an extra flick. So then you can try and do it again. But if your shield goes off the table or when you drop all of your pieces on the table, if your pieces at any of time go off the table as well, your turn ends as well. First one to 21 points win. It's that simple and straightforward. No stretch goals, no Kickstarter exclusives, no FOMO. Looks like there's a couple of reviews out there. Pawn's Perspective, Eric's Playing, and what is it? 15 bucks. $20 if you want the variant deluxe version. 30 bucks if you want to play, Matt. And if you want everything, $40. So it looks like a lot of people are going for the $40 straightforward you know what you're getting you know what it looks like you know how it plays not a whole lot of guessing here it's either for you you either like the concept like a little bit of twist on the dexterity flicking game or you don't i mean that's it heads will roll period speaking of other dexterity games i, I did know about this one flick fleet blocks of flicks again 10 times its funding goal low funding goal but this is their third kickstarter with this game and this is not a widely available game and so they're offering a little bit of, I think, one of the previous expansions that was offered during one of the prior Kickstarters in a limited amount in this campaign. But this is, again, it's relatively straightforward. It's an 1v1 dueling game, Star Trek slash Star Wars slash Space Galaxies, whatever name you want to put to it, flicking dice off of plastic ships at each other and adding all of the variables and accoutrements that you can think of, whether it's missiles, lasers, shields, debris, anything like that. Because they also offer a ton of little mini expansions that each add like a separate little element. And that's part of what you can get in this campaign. You can see that some of this is just, like I said here, $9 gets you two of those little add-ons, two of the deluxe add-ons. And that's the difference between the etching and the non-etched. So you can see here, you've got the etched on one side, so they show it down here. Here are all the little add-ons. Talk about that in a second. 
But here, the deluxe, the standard. So you can see the difference between the two of them. And is that, you know, something that you really want to pay for in the terms of the difference in price versus functionality or, or not? Because it doesn't really change the functionality. It just, the deluxe etches detail and ship names. Standard just doesn't have it. So if you're not keen on it, don't worry about it. But here are all those things that I mentioned. Aid ships, technicians, upgraded railgun, railgun cruiser, salvage vessels, wreckage, hyperspace kraken hyperspace kraken there is the term of this week that i never thought i'd be saying and hearing it come out of my mouth hyperspace kraken folks nebula so you have little gates block some of the line of sight and you can get all of the various pledge levels like i talked about this is not something that you should have a lot of wonder on this is either going to attract you or not this is not a game of going oh i wonder what this is going to be like oh i hope the gameplay holds up at the end after they no i mean boom here you go people there's enough out there. There's enough on Board Game Geek. There's enough of just looking at it and seeing what it is. Hyperspace Kraken. And <laughs> Hyperspace Kraken. I'm not going to really get that out of my head now. Stretch goals. It basically, they're just allowing them to choose additional add-ons that you can want. So nothing fancy there. Uh, just additional things here like this. Comets, pirates, pirates, pirates. And shipping's not too bad. So outside of the EU, it's, it's relatively good. I mean, what you're getting with that components, again, also is not, you know, the biggest and the most deluxification. So you're not going to be worried about too big of box from that side of things. It's definitely a niche within a niche, but it definitely has appeal too. So, I mean, otherwise it wouldn't have funded three times in three separate campaigns over a couple of years. There you go. Flick Fleet. I'm not going to get it, but I won't lie. It's tempting. I mentioned this one last week, right when I was posting the video. Bear Raid and Ghost of Christmas got added to Board Game Geek, but I didn't have a chance to look at them because I just didn't. Factory Funner is a well-known quantity. The price point is $34. Bear Raid is $34. Bear Raid is a little bit of a stock market game. Ghost of Christmas, I didn't know what to expect. This is 100 and almost 50% funded right now. I'm backing this. And the question you're going to go is, is Chris, why are you backing this right now? I'm backing this because Ghost of Christmas is a remake of a Japanese game, a trick-taking game, that has had wide acclaim, but very, very low distribution and availability over like the past two and a half or three years since it came out, called Time Palatrix. And the great thing about Time Palatrix, if you like trick-taking games, is it's one of the most unique that I have ever played. You do things out of order. There are three, essentially, hands that you're playing at the same time, and you get to choose which card you're playing in which hand versus the other people all at the same time and you can play one to the first slot and the second person can play one to the third slot and the last person could be playing something in the second slot and so you could all be trying to then adjust to see what the other people play and so you're also again on top of that you're trying to figure out and bid how many tricks do you think i'm going to win so it's a great game it's a great game i have a copy that looks like this I contacted a couple people over in Japan to see if they could help me out. And one of them all of a sudden like randomly responded one day saying, hey, you messaged me a while ago about this. And it's all of a sudden available in the shop and getting stuff from Japan. Let me tell you as a side note is a whole interesting experience. You have to have a forwarding company that will consolidate and give you a mail address essentially to get them there. And then you have to pay them additional shipping to get it over here, a flat fee on top of that. And shipping's expensive, folks. Shipping is expensive. So it cost me a fair bit to get this game, along with a few others at this point. Let me tell you, it is definitely, if you like trick-taking games, I have no question endorsing and recommending this. And the artwork is fantastic. I'm not sure I'm as big a fan of the theme because Time Palatrix really has no theme whatsoever. I, I'm not going to lie. The theme is basically non-existent. So I am backing it just so I can get a themed version and maybe I'll sell. Some collector will want Time Palatrix, but this game looks great. I've played it. I have it in my collection. It's not going anywhere. So I endorse it wholly from that side of things. Now, Factory Funner. I talked about this last week and the price point is pretty good, $34. I watched some gameplay. I watched the, the gameplay and I looked through the rule book. And this is a game where I like the concept of it, but I'm not sure I'd like the actuality of it just because of how you're having to connect these hexagonal pieces. Because you have these hexagonal pieces that you are flipping over simultaneously each round and the number that is equal to the number of players, I think. And then you are looking at them and desperately reaching out and grabbing or actually just touching whichever one you want. And so the first person that does it basically takes a penalty 
because you get one less revenue. And then the person who is last, sort of whichever one they get forced into, they get an additional revenue at the end, sort of as a balancing act. So you maybe want to be the first one and get the one you really, really want, but you better be sure that it's the one you want because you have to be able to play it or your revenue is definitely affected. And the other weird thing about this is all these other pieces that you're seeing, you're just paying for. So sometimes you may have to just use them and you may lose money even if your factory is working well in terms of the output here with the black one and the pink ones connecting here and the yellow one connecting here because the dots are the in and the numbers are the output. So this is how much pink it requires to work. This is how much yellow that this one produces. It's an interesting concept. I would definitely play it, but I don't think I would buy it just because of the calculations of some of that upkeep at the end of the round. And no, I make it sound probably a lot harder than it is, but I look at that and I go, I don't think I would have fun doing that. And so for me, after reading that today, I'm going to be passing on it. And so that's why I'm actually only at the $15 pledge level, even though it's probably more of a value to get at least two of these three together. The last one is bear raid. You're going to buy stock and you're going to short stock and they relate it even to the whole GME thing that's going on right now. So if you're following that at all, I'm not going to get into that, but that is what they're relating it to at least this though is something i believe if i'm reading this correctly is something that's new not like the other two where it's more of a reprint and a reskin if you will the interesting thing about this is this is a three player game so again you have to have three players which i guess makes sense if it is emulating the market where a 1v1 isn't really going to do that quite the same if you're interested, though, if this hasn't peaked to you yet, if you're more on the complex side of the increased overhead or the increased tactical strategic gameplay, this is by Ryan Courtney, the same guy who did Pipeline. And I know Pipeline is very well thought of on the heavy, hard, cutthroat Euro side of things, as well as the follow-up two-player game, Curious Cargo, which is using sort of the same theme. So what are you actually doing? You're buying or shorting stocks. You use the dice to affect the forecast, you draw and roll them, matching to the forecast values, and then it's just adjusting that and hoping that you've actually made it work. Shorting, if you're not familiar, is you're saying, I think by X date, the price is going to go down to this level, in case you weren't familiar with that. It's totally a different scheme of looking at things. And you can see the rule book here. It's not a very long rule book. It's only four pages. So again, as they say with all three of these games, these are not high overhead games. These are not highly super dense and complex, and they all have a relatively shorter-ish playtime. But again, the rule book is relatively straightforward. It's a relatively easy read. It's very thematic in terms of how you're pumping and dumping is sort of what the term is, whether you're buying or shorting the stocks during your turn, or you're taking the dice from a company and putting them behind your screen, and you have this multiplier here that will help you manipulate the market along with the dice. All in all, it's a different take on things. I haven't really seen much like it. I don't really look into this stuff though, so maybe there is a bunch of other stuff out there like it, but if there is, I wasn't aware of it. All in all, uh, relatively impressive. I was not sure what to expect when I heard about this trifecta, and like I said, Obviously, the quality shows because you wouldn't be raising $73,000 in the first 24 hours if it wasn't. So there you go. Dirge, the Rust Wars. Again, this is another one that is almost funded, $7,000, which doesn't seem like a whole lot. But for a game I've never heard of, that's pretty good. And the artwork is relatively impressive just on the little movie screen here. It is a, another game in the overly crowded two-player skirmish battling type game. But it does have a little bit different theme than your generic mages throwing magic at each other or duelists in that sense. Now, the description of the game and the gameplay, as you can see here on this little gif, is drastically different than what you would expect. Because you have nine asymmetrical units per side and you are choosing two of them and their various abilities of cards that go along with them to create your warband or your deck, if you will. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be playing these cards, gaining control of these locations, and that's going to be how you're scoring points. And so if you score up to 12 points over the game, you win. Side note here, since we're comparing prices today, and these are all card games, $18 plus domestic, as it says for the US, is four bucks, so $22 all in. It's pretty good. It's not as large of a deck or a card game as some of the others though, but I think the artwork speaks for itself and that it seems to be relatively quality. So how do you actually score those points though that I just mentioned? 
you beat somebody, you destroy a unit, you play two or more cards, or you got both cards of your units on the board. And then the last one, you just control certain areas, you get an extra point as well. Locations have effects. There's time in the day that's going to be different effects. It's more of an area control skirmish game rather than a head-to-head -head dueling game, as I sort of mentioned earlier. So that does set it apart. This is a game that actually intrigues me. This is probably the most interesting card game to me personally of the ones I've looked at so far in this video, just by how different it is and how I am actually really attracted to the art especially as a game I have never heard of, again, before looking at this page today. And it never hurts to have a quote from Space Biff on there, so that goes a long way, to be honest with you. Stretch goals, nothing. What you see is what you get. Limited print run, I mean, this is a game that I don't think you're going to be seeing at retail. It's just not. And so I am definitely going to be clicking Remind Me on this one, because I kind of like what I see. I hate saying that, because I really don't need to spend 22 more dollars. But I may have to read a little bit of the rule book here, a little bit more in depth of some of the abilities, and maybe even go to Space Biff's uh, discussion of it, because I wasn't expecting to like this, and I kind of do. So it reminds me more of one of my favorite games of this year so far, a little bit in that sense, but in completely different of Jingi, of this under the radar indie type game that is smaller footprint and smaller in size but packs an amazingly high amount of gameplay and depth i think this one you guys need to check out i think you, this one you guys need to check out and see if it's for you i mean it's no problem gonna fun but it's only gonna be 10 days long so you need to be aware that it's ending relatively soon too it's only eight more days so there you go dirge the rust wars check it out can i just say look all you deluxe euro guys and girls and everyone else out there you can just buy the coins separately, folks. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anyway, Quad City Killers. Murderous fun for the whole family. A 2.0 version of it. I don't know. I'm never really a big fan of this type of theme for some reason. It just sort of misses the mark always for me. But I know that a lot of people like this. Especially like on the opposite side of things. That how to hunt a serial killer or something. And just the whole fascination within our culture of this sort of theme as well. Definitely hits home with some people. And so this is a game where you are role-playing as a serial killer, trying to rack up the kills and stay one step ahead of the local authorities. And as you get more kills under your belt, your skills go up and your ability to do so becomes better. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be just choosing one possible actions when a prey card of who you're trying to kill in that sense comes up. Hunting, traveling, attacking creating a scene, or even just discarding to replace them from the resource deck. And so what you're going to be doing essentially is when you attack a prey, you have your own modifier, you have whatever resource cards that are in your hand, and then you're rolling dice. And if it's greater than the defense, well, you win. If you succeed, great, you get the card. If you fail, those resource cards that you used are lost. And if you do that enough times in the city, the heat or the presence is notified and the police become a lot more interested in what's going on the artwork is good but it's just not my type of thing whatsoever it's about action optimization this is an action optimization puzzle with a little bit of randomness thrown in with a little bit of way to mitigate it with those resource cards again i think what you see is what you get the basic pledge level is 35 dollars, so i think it's a little expensive for what i would expect uh, if you want to get yourself in the game as a likeness it's going to be 45 dollars, and that's where a lot of people are and then if you want to be a killer with your likeness, you can pay $65. Again, a lot of people are in there. I'm not surprised that it's raised this much money. I guess the question just is how appealing is this overall to people? And we'll see. It's got over three weeks left. It's 50% of the funding goal already. I would be surprised if it doesn't fund. But I mean, personally for me, I can easily pass on it just because it doesn't strike home to any of the mechanisms or the theme that I'm interested in. But it looks like, again, it's something a little bit unique, but also something straightforward that would be easy to get to the table. So that's Quad City Killers. Murderous fun for the whole family. <laughs> it sounds weird coming out of my mouth. If you're interested, there you go. So this was originally supposed to launch last week. It launched now on the 23rd, Battle for Baternia. This is an expansion hero pack called Pixelvania. Just as you would expect by the name, it gives you exactly what you would be thinking when you think of Pixel and Vania. 
It's old school Castlevania-esque theme. There's a slayer, there's a demon, there's a vampire, there's a werewolf. And it's adding those heroes in on top of the base game in a two-player MOBA-esque game to begin with. I know people are always mixed feelings about the sprite sort of pixel-esque art. Personally, I'm a big fan of it. I have no problem with it. And I think it's something unique. It sets you apart from the crowd. I'm a little surprised it isn't more funded, even in the first 24 hours here, but I don't think there's any problem with it actually funding. And I'll tell you right now, I'm actually backing this. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it, but it's intriguing enough to me that I don't think I would pick it up at retail. So it's a two-player MOBA-esque game, and you're trying to destroy the other person's quote-unquote bit, which is essentially their base. And you're choosing or drafting a team of five of these heroes that come within the base game or the and or the expansion in order to create your team, they give you a few preset teams that you can kind of go with, or you can just go with whatever suits your fancy. And all of these different heroes have different strengths, weaknesses, abilities, modifiers, ways in which they play, ways in which they interact. And so you can customize it how you want. And they're offering it at least at the Kickstarter price with the stretch goals from the original Kickstarter. So you can get in at the same price as previous backers did already limited spots but i mean clearly you can see that only at 50 percent of its funding level there's not a lot of limitation to that right now so if you really wanted one i think you could easily get one it's standees i mean that's why the price is what it is 74 dollars. so that's what you're getting for that you're getting the hero cards the power cards and the reference cards as well as the standee and you're just getting these six in the expansion so a bone mage i think that's cool they're not going with a typical like mummy or zombie or something they're going with something completely different so I give them credit for that, too, because that's just kind of cool. And I believe they got some stretch goals here that add a few others to the expansion. The base game has something like 19 heroes, I believe, with their own skills and abilities, like I mentioned. If you add in the 19 plus the six that are there, that's 25 already. And if they hit some stretch goals, you've got four more heroes. So 29 heroes, you have a team of five each. So you're not even barely using a third of the heroes total each game. So there's a lot of variety, a lot of mixing and matching there. The question just is, it's a two-player only game, and does this suit you? Because what you're doing is it's also different in how it plays, because it plays in a sense that you are action programming. So you program a card down for each of these heroes that you have, each of these five various heroes that you choose, and you can see all of them right here, a little bit of Kenobi. Anyway, and you're assigning the order in which these cards are going to go, and then you maneuver, i.e. you move each of your pieces, and then each one of those actions happens. So you're lining them up in terms of what order and what character they're going to go along with, and so hopefully your moves work, your opponents miss, but in case your thing misses, you can also discard that action card that is unused to get gold or to rest and heal your heroes so they don't get killed. And you're trying to make your way all the way to the other side to destroy the bit that I mentioned. It's just straightforward. It looks like something that would be easy and fun, and I'm just not sure how it would get to the table in front of a lot of the other two-player games that I have because I don't see my wife necessarily liking this, but I like the idea of action programming in this aspect. I don't like it in all aspects, but in this aspect, it seems to be unique. There's enough information as well out there uh, in case you're aware. Obviously, so very wrong about games. They're very well known. Space Biff is very well known. So both of them have quotes on here. And so there's enough out there, again, that you should be able to get a relatively informed opinion about whether or not this is going to appeal to you. Like I said, I'm interested. I'm going to probably watch a little bit of gameplay a little bit more uh, after I do this video in the next couple days. So I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it or not, but it's definitely right now, as you can see, I'm pledging for it. So we'll just see if I end up keeping it. That is Battle for Paternia with the expansion as well as the base game. Check it out. So here we go. Fjords by Grail Games. It's already had about eight times its funding goal within the first 24 hours. It is, as they are describing it, Returns of a Classic. Now, my question last week when I talked about it was, why am I going to back this game? What is new? What is different? Where is my incentive to back this game? And so looking at the Kickstarter page today, I think that the price point is about right of what I expected. The price point is $26 without any of the exclusives. And the Yarl Pledge for $46, and this is where the exclusives come in, and this is where I'm not necessarily as interested as I hoped I was going to be, because the extras are two-player bonus pieces, so you can do this epic mode, and you can also play up to four players, as well as this Secret Runes mini expansion, which basically allows you to have like teleporters, essentially, 
on different parts of the board, if I'm thinking of it correctly. And then you get this Runestones Deluxe Upgrade, which is weird because I don't view this Deluxe Upgrade that they're giving because this is nice wooden pieces and they make these chunky plastic pieces as the Deluxe Upgrade. So for me, if anything, I always think of it as the other way. Like I want nice wooden pieces as my upgrade. Uh, plastic or whatever they're made of in this doesn't really appeal to me as much. And so I don't really see how it's different than the game itself in the first place. Because it's a tile laying and then sort of area majority, area control type mechanic with your various longhouses and meeples. Here, as I said, the Jarl, they can move longhouses after they've been placed. Secret passages will open up. So I mean, not teleportation, but next best thing. Gives two players a nod to use in a four player game because you're just going to need more pieces. I don't know what they're going to be adding here. They're adding one runestone right now, so that's not super enticing. As well, with a game that was good at the time, a 6.5, but I don't see anything that really makes me jump out and say, I really need to play this right now. I really need to buy this right now versus later, because I'm not necessarily looking for a four-player abstract game. I mean, I am, but this doesn't necessarily scream to me that. As a two-player game, I see other things out there that I already have that are more interesting to me. Yes, you're potentially going to be saving money, but like I said, I don't think the Jarl uh, exclusives are enough to entice me significantly at this point. Shipping is fine. Shipping is what it is. The game itself, reading the rules, it's not a very complicated game. You have four of these tiles sitting face up, and you're choosing one of them, and you're connecting them, and you have to make the sides match. Now, the other thing is you cannot create a second complete landmass. So the land has to be contiguous. There can be holes or gaps, but it cannot be two separate landmasses, as you can see here. And you play all of these tiles in the first phase. This is not a phase one, phase two, phase one, phase two, phase one, phase two. This is a phase one game for everybody. And then once phase one is over, then everybody does phase two. What else do you do in phase one? You're placing these long houses out that are going to be your settlements and that you're going to be placing on top of some of these tiles that you're laying on the landmass. And then when all of them are played out, then you are placing, you can see the long house right here, for example, and it has to be played on a green grass area. Then you're playing a meeple. The thing with the meeples is they have to be adjacent to another meeple or they have to be on a longhouse or adjacent to a longhouse. And so it, that is where the area control element comes in. And that is where the game sort of branches, literally and figuratively, because you play until you cannot play anymore. And so depending on where your longhouses are, depending on how strategic you want to do or be in terms of cutting off other people and preventing them from expanding further, that is where the abstract element is really stronger, where the tactical and strategic nature comes in in the first place. So I'm talking myself into it more at the same time. Again, I don't know that there's any reason I need to get it now versus later. I now definitely thinking about this would be a game I'd love to try at some point. But is it a game I need to get on Kickstarter? I don't know. Is the base game that hard to get the old version? I don't know. And $26 is a great price. But with the shipping added in there, that might be a little bit more not to my liking. So I think it's going to be a relatively solid abstract game, but I'm not sure I need the four player. I'm not sure I'd want to play this four player. And I'm not sure I need necessarily the expansion or need the expansion at a plastic level. So for those reasons, I mean, I'm definitely going to click remind me on it, but I'm just not convinced one way or the other yet. So I'll definitely watch it. I'm probably going to have to watch a little bit of gameplay, but I could see myself easily skipping this, but actually having read the rules now, I see why it is funding the way it is. And which is, again, relatively quite well for an abstract, even though it is sort of a reprint. So yeah, Fjords, check it out. Surprisingly better than I expected. Trick-taking games, all the rage. No, I don't know what it is, but they, like they say, it comes in waves. So this is Tomb the Light Edition. I mentioned it last week because the creators had reached out to me. And it's a, just another twist on the trick-taking game from three to four players that you can play competitively or you can play in teams. The trick being with this one is how these abilities get linked together, the strength of them, as well as how the trump varies from round to round. I'll be honest, I really like the artwork and I like the concept of spells. You know, I'm a big fantasy guy to begin with. So let's check it out. $15 plus the free mini gold expansion. 
that's a great price. You've seen all the prices now. If you've watched this video so far, that's a great price. Uh, no matter what the shipping is, if it's under like 10 bucks. So here you go. You get to see a little bit of everything. Light spells are stronger than any non-Trump spells. Spell example, place the title spell in your hand at the end of the chapter. So you can manipulate maybe how you're going to be playing them. Look at the bottom of the spell deck, changes its element, increase by three for each other. And so this one, for example, brings up the point of how this game is different. And so when somebody else plays a card within an element, you can chain them together to be able to use their abilities. And depending on what you play or what is played next, you can either break the chain or continue on the chain. And sometimes it may benefit you to do one or the other. The other difference here is that Trump is not chosen. Trump is revealed from the top of the deck. So you need to be aware of that. That may appeal to some people that may not. Here's one of those special light spells that I talked about that they all mentioned that they're different. They don't have an effect, but they all share the same property that it's stronger than any non-Trump spell. It is higher than anything else because if no Trump is played in a round, then the colors are meaningless and it's just a number. But that's saying that this is sort of second tier Trump, essentially, if you will. Here's the chains that I talked about that are going to be able to activate an ability. But if it's breaking the chain, it gets silenced. So the ability cannot be done. Survival mode, if you don't want to play teams. And the rule book is right there. So I wish I, I could tell you more about this. They offered to send me a copy and I may have to take them up on it because I think it's an interesting take on the trick taking side of things. They have 30 days to go and they're almost at what, 30%? Uh, I definitely think that's a higher funding goal than some of the other card games we saw on here. But is it unique? Is the art style good? I think, yeah. I think this is going to be one of those games where it's sometimes more the marketing and the hype and the knowledge about a game rather than is a game good or not and that determining alone whether it funds. Because if that was the case, I think you'd see some things that definitely fund a lot easier and some things that definitely don't fund a lot easier out there. And so I hope this funds. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to, I I clicked save already. And so I'm definitely going to have to look into this a little bit more. I may, like I said, I may have to reach out to them and see if I can get a copy to play. There you go. Tomb, the light edition. So next up is Questeros. And this must be the week of trick taking games and just card games in general, because I feel like that's all I'm talking about this week. But this is a card game as well as a tarot deck all mixed in one. It's about a third of the way to its funding goal in under 24 hours and it takes your basic trick taking tropes as i've talked about previously and introduces sort of the dm D, D type theme and they call tricks instead in this game quests and so again as with a couple of the others you're trying to predict not only how many quests or tricks you win each round but the flavor or the twist in this game is that there are certain quest cards and this is where it gets a little confusing you could use two different monikers or names there i think that would have been a little more helpful you have these individual quest cards that all have special abilities so basically special ability cards that allow you to do something different that also act as sort of a super trump if you will they win the trick alongside whatever else so you're going to be winning tricks just like that but you have to follow suit and so it's the first one up to a certain number of points or quests one that will ultimately win the game. It reminds me a little bit of some of the other ones I've talked about in combination with a little bit of the Tournament at Camelot or Tournament at Avalon, those retail games that I'm really a big fan of personally because there's a lot of take that. I don't think there's as much take that in this one with some of the ability cards, but it's kind of hard to tell because they only use one example of the Warlock down below. Why are you getting it now? Well, bonus tokens. And so I'm not sure if these tokens are really necessary, but they also say that if you're a late backer or if you're an upgrade backer, you're not going to get them. What is it going to cost you? It's going to cost you 25 bucks plus shipping, which is pretty comparable to the rest. With the amount of cards, it's probably pretty comparable too because there's something what 22 and 56 so 78 and they're tarot size so it's a little bit larger than usual i think or is that a little smaller ah you can figure it out so that's it and you're playing what over oh sorry not to a point total but seven rounds i was wrong and you can see that there are two main classes and then you earn points based on the way i just mentioned it's a short campaign I think it's an interesting one. It definitely is something that would stand out in a normal week, but now all of a sudden with these trick takers, I don't know. And I wonder again, if it's a very crowded market, personally, the one I've played is going to get my money because I love time Palatrix and the remake there, but 
this is another one that I'm probably going to do another remind me and see what comes of it in 10 days or so. That's Questeros. Now, this is another really interesting concept. Card game, dual, solo, free game, just pay shipping of two euros. 3,600 people, they're already three times their funding goal. And this is one of those where you try a concept and you see what works. And so far, it's working. So what do you actually need to know about this project, apart from the fact that they are really emphasizing zero dollars, zero euros, except for the two euro flat fee wherever you send in the world. And that is, they're going to be sending you this deck in an envelope so that you can get it at that rate. Interesting thing that you need to know. I'll say straight out, this is a great concept. They make it very clear that this is a game that started in 2020 over in France and it's being translated into English. And if they get enough backers in other languages, they'll translate it there too. But... This is the starter kit <laughs> that cannot be emphasized enough. What you're doing is you are drafting with your opponent to make the best eight card hand or deck that you can, and then laying those cards out against each other over two sides of two bridges that then battle against each other by using mana and summoning your units. And you can see a little bit of what I'm talking about right here. And now they said originally they did it in 2020, like I mentioned, and then they released an expansion each month on top of that. That is the key point, folks, is this is only the starter. So is this going to be supported? What is it going to cost you to do anything beyond these 32 cards that you're going to be getting to form your decks? And I was expecting to sort of see a hook somewhere later down the line or with the other pledge list, but there are none, as where is all that other content that you mentioned about being a standalone expansion? Because you could probably get people hooked in that way. When is it going to come around next? What is it going to look like in the future? And so it doesn't make me necessarily as comfortable backing a project that I'm not sure of if I'd like, that there may not be enough depth to, even though I'm getting it at a relatively cheap cost. Because I think that is one of the big fallacies in our hobby that I see all the time. People are like, well, it's cheap, so I should get it. Yeah, tell me about that epic card game from five, six, seven, eight years ago that thousands of people got, like myself, because it was cheap, but I've never played it. Because ultimately, just because it was cheap didn't mean I was interested in it. It just was cheap and an interesting concept. And that's what I fear with something like this. Now then, they talk about here that if this succeeds, they'll have the necessary dynamic to publish additional paid content on a regular basis. So there's a little bit of something right there. But I, I just wish there was something more firm in terms of what to expect, what to see down the line. And it just makes me a little, you know, especially if this is a French game to begin with. How easy is it going to be able to get across the pond? I mean, if I was in Europe, I'd probably be all over this, to be very frank with you. But if I'm wondering if the distribution is going to be such that it's going to be twice as much for me to get it across the Atlantic as it is for them in there, it it could be $10 in expansion, but if I'm going to pay $20 or $30 by the time I get it, like I mentioned earlier in the video with the shipping from Japan, the games themselves were not terribly expensive, but the shipping almost killed it. That's what I'd be concerned about in this in the future. Not that it's going to be like that, but that's just where my mind automatically starts jumping to three steps ahead every time. That's why my wife also hates me sometimes when she brings up a question or an issue, because I do the same thing there. But all in all, I mean, it's a solid, solid concept. It's done Magic the Gathering in a different, unique way in terms of drafting, in terms of laying cards down, in terms of battling. So I don't think there's any question about that. And if it's intriguing to you at all, it's probably still worth the risk. Because like I said, worst case scenario, three bucks and you're out of it and you don't give it a second thought. So all in all, I'd say probably check it out. I'd say probably check it out. I'm going to click remind me on this and again, see what happens when it gets closer to the end. Clash of Deck. I can see why it's at the top of the hotness or the popularity today on Kickstarter. I'm gonna mention this just because it's launching and it's raised almost $30,000, but again, this is well outside of my depth, as I mentioned earlier, the Warfighter Expansion Packs Wave number three from DVG. This is a tactical, solitaire, or cooperative card game where you're selecting your squad, you're trying to execute the mission by fighting your way to achieve whatever objective you're trying to do in both modern eras as well as past eras of war. And you can see just a little bit here about some of the operations and some of the battles that they offer that they're offering in this campaign alone. And they even talk about how to incorporate them. Again, getting well outside my wheelhouse. It's more of a card game as a war game, but it's still more of a war game. And so it is definitely something that I cannot do due diligence on. And there's just a lot of stuff listed in this campaign. It's just a lot of expansions. Just a lot of expansions that you're going to be able to get. They price it all out. It looks like they're going to be getting a lot of their back catalog too. So 
I know that this is really popular, but it's never interested me. But I think it's worth a shout out because it is a card game and it's a war game. So there you go. Speaking of card games, apparently murder mysteries are also the thing. If you have not known about the game series The Escapes and The Adventure Ones, escape room style games, because that's what this is. I mean, it's labeled escape game as a murder mystery. This is also the rage. I think that deserves its own video when I think about it. So I won't go into that as a ramble or a rant right now for you guys. I think I've done enough. This video is long enough without it. But this is putting puzzles, narrative, and apparently some technology. So we'll take a look at what technology they're using all wrapped up in a box. And it's already raised $50,000, which is not inconsiderable for the mechanisms as well as the theme, as we've seen with other campaigns already earlier in this video that have not been doing nearly as well. So this is by Key Enigma, who did one of these games back that funded in 2020 and funded for 86,000 euros. So the fact, I guess, that this is already at 50,000 US dollars is not as surprising, knowing that they've already done one of these and so people must like it. And I know that people really dig these and pick these up at retail all the time. Again, I'm not going to get on that tangent. Okay, back to the game. So it's got eight escapes in one box. So for a pledge level, depending on what the cost actually is, that could be good. So let's see, $66, 66 euros or $79. So $80 plus eight escapes in one box. It looks like there's one story through all eight escapes. I'm assuming that's what this is. You're adding mysterious envelopes, which is always a crowd pleaser, as I've mentioned previously with my Zombie Kids Evolution and Zombie Teens Evolution. It is a timed early bird as well. So if you're looking at this, you want to probably watch this video and then go check it out because the early bird is not going to be too much longer after this video is posted. And so let's see what it actually is because, whoa, that's a big jump. $79 to $106. That is, that's, that's a ton. That's not an early bird. That's $25 discount. That is ridiculous. So you definitely want to check this video out if this is of interest to you at all by the time this launches. I mean, pause the video and go get a backer pledge if you're looking. Because there's also a deluxe version, a Kickstarter exclusive, and you're getting deluxe artifacts and deluxe packaging. We'll kind of take a look down here and below. You can kind of get a look-see and kind of see what it is. So box full of mysteries, independent puzzles, uh, sophisticated story between all of them. So what's actually in the box? Logic puzzles, immersive digital puzzles, investigation puzzles, advanced puzzles. I am a crossword puzzle type of person, so these games do nothing for me, but there you go. Puzzles can be reset. Don't worry if you get stuck. You can get advice in the game, and there's a demo that you can actually play. Basically trying to find this psychopath, and you think it starts off very simple, and it turns much more complex, twisted. Here's what you're actually getting. Now, it doesn't say what these deluxe things are, I guess. You're kind of taking a little bit of a risk there. And here you go. This is probably the one thing that you would probably want to know is why would you do this versus other things? And they don't necessarily compare it to other escape room games, which is what I wish they would have done, but just escape rooms in general. Extra puzzles. Now, this is probably a big one right here. Extra puzzles. And we'll see what else gets unlocked with the stretch goals. Again, this does nothing for me, but I know a lot of people that really love these things. So... $20 for shipping to the US and the Euro shipping is less. So I have no doubt why this raised what it is, especially if it's as high quality as it seems. And if it wasn't, I don't think it'd be raising. I think you would have seen it with the previous reviews of the first Kickstarter campaign and it wouldn't be doing nearly as well. That is Escape Room in a Box, Murder Mystery. And you should check it out if you're interested because otherwise you're going to miss off on a potentially $25 discount by the end of the day that this video airs. So there you go. You have Solani and you have the girl who made the stars and they are both based off of stories about how the stars were created and they are two separate yet both equally dynamic and different games in how they play. Solani in particular is the one that is of more interest to me. This is more of an abstract game and as I said before abstracts are more of my thing than I care to let on, unfortunately. So this definitely has of interest when you start using pieces in this way with a play mat that looks as beautiful as this does. So what are you actually doing? Tile laying and drafting. Again, two terms that I like to hear. Now, one to four players as an abstract game does worry me a little bit because sometimes when you get abstracts that are more than two players, the balance isn't quite as strong. But what you're doing here 
is you are doing the snake draft. The one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one style of Catan drafting. Connect the stars, observe where the planets are, place the celestial bodies in the right way to make the constellation puzzles correct, and get points. After 12 rounds, the game ends. So what are you doing? Laying a star, clockwise order, select a tile of the same type, start with the last player, draft the other types of tiles, then once you have both, you just lay tiles down with a couple adjacency rules, and then rinse and repeat. I'm going to have to watch a how to play, I'll be honest with you. This is a game that I'm interested in, but I'm not sure about. Part of that reason, I'll go into in a little bit when we get further down on the Kickstarter page. The Girl Who Made the Stars, now this is the other one that is more of a worker placement. Again, the style and the production looks beautiful. That I think you cannot question, but if this is more of the Euro style, it is definitely not for me, and here are your workers that I'm assuming you're going to be placing. So that, without having to read it page by page to you, you're going to be putting your tiles down, when you make a pattern that's closed off, you have a constellation, you're going to be using that in combination with villagers to forage and then bring back that light to the village in the first place. They've already hit some stretch goals here. Three more offering cards. It looks like they're going to be alternating between Solani and the girl who made the stars. So the question is, I don't see any mention of if these are going to be Kickstarter exclusive, included at retail. What is going to be the reason I back this on Kickstarter in the first place, and I have not seen anything to address that yet. You've got a couple videos here talking about the game. These look like a little bit of preview, a little bit of review and combination. This is my biggest hesitation right here, folks, is because they're saying this is going to be $60 games each at retail and $49 for an abstract game of that size. And I don't know. That's a lot of money for an abstract, especially when I've got a couple on the way that were considerably less. And that's not even accounting shipping. So you're going to be talking probably easily 60 plus before shipping. And that makes me a little bit, yeah, so $15. So $64 with shipping included for one game. An abstract and $110 for both of them. That's a lot of money for uh, what it is. And again, I think you can look at this and get a good sense that the production is going to be good. The, the design is definitely aesthetically pleasing. This is a relatively known company. Merchant's Cove is being delivered. Monsters on Board, which I remember being up last year, was a game I had glanced at, but ultimately not been interested in. A couple other games, Robin Hood and the Merry Men, which I think sort of had a little bit of mixed review. I can't speak to that exactly, but I was not impressed by what people were saying online. As beautiful as these themes tie in with the gameplay, it's the gameplay ultimately that has to stand out and make me want to play it over other things. One thing while looking through the rule book that makes me wonder about this is one of the phases on Solani, the game I'm interested in more, is going from phase two, which is the tile selection or the drafting, to placement. And so this is sort of I'm not sure if this is going to work well, especially with three or four people. That makes me a little nervous. The talk about here, drafting two tiles, one of each type, and putting them in your holding spaces. Once you have drafted both of your tiles, though, you can proceed immediately to the placement phase without waiting for other people to make their selection. And then they go down in here and they even clarified even further, immediately proceed. And you can just immediately place them into the puzzle, simultaneously even. You're just following the rules of adjacency and type, which is a little bit of a real-time element and a little bit of a hurry type game. And when I'm playing an abstract, the whole point of it oftentimes is there is a little bit of perfect information or akin to that. And I don't want to have to be feeling like I'm rushed to do it. And so I don't know how I feel about this. I, I don't know. It makes me a little bit wary, especially at the higher player count. And so I can't speak to if any of these videos that are out here on Solani talk about that whatsoever, but it would make me kind of nervous, especially if they don't. And I just, I'm not willing to spend that much money on a kind of sort of maybe at this point. 64 bucks is a lot of money for a game and abstract that is not as large as I would expect for the price point. And again, it's about sometimes value. And I don't think you're doubting any of the quality, but sometimes it just doesn't hit home. And this is a game that I would probably love to play, but I'm not sure I'd be willing to pay that much for it at this point. So we'll see. I mean, I'm going to click remind me. But I'm not probably going to be pledging at this point until I watch some of those other videos and read a little bit more about it. But 
that is Solani and the Girl Who Made the Stars, and you should probably check it out because I'm guessing that at least some of you will be interested in this. I'm going to talk about this because it's out there, because it's raised almost $5,000, which is significantly more than some of the other games on the list. It's a what would you do party game, and I just, you know, it's just not funny anymore. Like, you couldn't come up with a better name than that. It's just doing that for shock value, these cards against humanity type of games. And I don't think the creativity or the shock value is very interesting nowadays. So personally, I would easily pass on it. It's a party game. It's hypothetical situations. And I mean, they what connects us is spite. So that sort of description doesn't really make me want to back a game, but I'll mention it just because they talk about you have to have these five different plot cards in hand that you need to use in your story. So that's what you're doing. You're trying to judge then sort of apples to apples ask who has the best story. So there you go. That's all I'm going to talk about. It. This is Sephiroth. It's raised 72,000 or about 61,000 euros within 24 hours of launching. And again, it's another card game. Somehow we have two tarot card games launching on the same week in the same day even. I've looked through this. It's based off of the Tales uh, off the Arabian coast. And it's a game of divination using these tarot cards that they researched heavily and that the artwork and the design is absolutely gorgeous. It might be the most gorgeous game I've looked at this week in terms of design art. But I'm not really sure what the game actually is. You can see the pledge levels. You can get three physical prints. And that's probably one of the most appealing to me pledge levels at this point. $36 for a digital side of things as well as the tarot card deck. And that's the early bird. And that's really the one that you're looking at right now in terms of the actual pledge levels. Because all the other pledge levels have a little bit of extras, enamel pins, other you know add-ons like that. These look fantastic. The detail is amazing. I love that moon card right there. That looks great. The design is quality. But I don't get a sense of what the game actually is. And they talk about the rules here where you're choosing an intention for your divination. You're drawing three cards. And then on your turn, you're drawing a card and playing a card in one of the three ways. Uh, sort of two ways, actually. You're playing a major onto the tree or the star field. You're playing a minor into this row of three. And then you can save cards for future turns. You lift them on this tree star field as you get the set of three done. And then it just says focus on powerful placements and combinations and match the values to reveal knowledge. But they don't talk about what that is or how that plays or how it actually can be solo, competitive, and cooperative. There's no other information on there. So I feel like I'm missing something somehow, but I've scanned this up and down several times and I just have no idea what else is in this game. And if this is truly just people backing it, at this point for like a super special tarot card sort of set that's because that's what it seems like now the interesting thing is they say in the first 12 hours you're gonna get a special variant and a five euro discount so i might even be at the time of filming this outside of that realm because well no sorry 60 minutes left here so i'm not outside that realm if i wanted it but so it'd be 25 euros or maybe 30 bucks but no i, I i'm not buying beautiful tarot cards I'm not necessarily seeing the game here, and without it, I'm not going to be, you know, taking a chance on that. So, well, there you go. If you want a beautiful set of tarot guards and maybe a game on top of it, this is for you. If not, mm, might want to wait or see what else they put out the next couple, you know, 30 days. Or just pass on it all together and see what it looks like at retail. Okay, if you were waiting for it, I finally got to it. I decided in this video I was going to try and do as many Kickstarters first, and then I'm going over to Robinson Crusoe here. So on GameFound, Robinson Crusoe launched on the 22nd. It's raised over half a million euros at this point. Why has it raised that much? Is that good? What are the pledge levels like? I have seen a lot of discussion on all of the usual forums and websites about how people feel on this. And there is very split opinion. And I know even in the comment section of the video of the upcoming Kickstarters last week, there was a few comments like, hey, it's going to be this or hey, it's going to be that. And this is what they're trying to do. So let's take a look because... They're doing the collector's edition with miniatures crafted by Awakened Realms, the tutorial campaign, which I think is a great idea, and a companion app, as well as the big book of adventures with lots of other scenarios that, as I talked about, that you can sort by theme, by complexity, by length, by difficulty, whatever you want on your game night. So, Portal Games, what are you getting? This is a 2012 game. This is sort of a nice feature. It's sort of annoying, too that they put a featured pledge up here. Like this is the one that the creator wanted you to choose. 
the 115 euro pledge, everything new. That's a lot. That's a lot. Let's not kid ourselves for a new, even if you already have the base game. So here are all the quotes. Here is all the description. Total value, 115 euros. Stretch goals, daily unlocks. Okay. Second day, unlock one stretch goal for the collector's edition. And the next day, a stretch goal for the book of adventures. So day one, models. Plastic models. Day two, a setting. So what are you getting with this 115 euro pledge? You're getting the core collector's edition, the stretch goals, the book of adventures and the stretch goals for the book of adventures. So you're getting the new core. And when, so when they say everything new, they don't mean non-core. So if you already have the core, maybe that's a little bit more palatable. What does the collector's edition have though that the core, the previous core doesn't? Because the Book of Adventures is 30 euros itself, which isn't bad, I think. If it really has as many adventures and scenarios in it as they're proposing, especially with some stretch goals there, that's probably pretty good. 50 scenarios. What is... I heard a couple people commenting online, especially from Europe, that the shipping for even just the Book of Adventures was going to be relatively restrictive. And 85 euros for the Deluxe Edition Core is a lot. Especially when I go over to the Board Game Geek price history page and I can see a copy right here for $25. So what is going to be the difference between me picking up a used copy for 25 bucks and an 85 euro pledge for a deluxe edition? Because that's a hundred US dollars right now. That's $75 difference. Do you love the game that much? Or is the deluxification worth $75 for times the cost of a used copy castaway veteran pledge so you get the upgrade pack again the upgrade pack here the book of adventures is 30 euros right so the upgrade package is 55 euros okay so what are we actually getting with this upgrade package you're getting okay stretch goals great 18 miniatures a plastic storage and a big box with an app that is 55 euros someone tell me i'm going crazy here and that i'm missing something and that this is a good deal because this does not look like a good deal to me i can buy the core game for 25 or 30 or 40 dollars here us and maybe get the book of adventures for less than the upgrade pack is going to cost me altogether that's ridiculous right am i am i the only one not am i the only one taking crazy pills here I feel like I'm taking crazy pills here. Nice Zoolander, Will Ferrell reference there. You know, dating myself. So anyway, check it out. Go Zoolander, highly underrated. Anyway, uh, sleeves, spyglass, all this other stuff. And then, you know, I've said this about Kickstarter projects and I'll say it about Game Palm projects too. I know nothing right now because you put all the rewards at the top. You don't tell me how the game is played. You don't tell me why I should back it now. You don't even tell me what I'm getting. I have to click on it on each individual pledge to tell me what I'm getting. And I'll say it on the Kickstarters, I'll say it here. I think that's poor design. That is marketing 101. That's not playing to getting the game. That's playing more on the FOMO for me. It doesn't make me feel like you're interested in presenting me with why I should buy the game and just that I need all the stuff instead. So island tiles, game board, and maybe those aren't included. Is that maybe something I'm missing? that some of this other Explorer board stuff isn't included. I hope so. But this is just all of the core game, right? The core deluxe, right? Yeah, this is the core deluxe. Book of Adventures, we've talked about that. It's got a bunch of stuff. Mystery Tales, another expansion that you can get. Here's another expansion, the treasure chest, mini promos and mini expansions, all of the mini stuff that's been released up until this point. 90 more cards, a whole bunch more stuff, new people, new characters, hunting gets more exciting, all of the old reviews from the original games and the how to play. Okay. Anything else we really need to know? Why back now? Here we go at the very bottom. Nope. Great price. Get it first. And yeah, Book of Adventures is going to cost you 45 euros. So Book of Adventures can cost you 45 euros or 53 US dollars. That's a lot for what it is. That's twice the, the book of adventures is going to cost you twice what the core game alone is going to cost you. So is it worth twice of the core? And I can't answer that question. I, I, I'll put my full disclaimer and my bias out there. I have no interest in this game. This game has absolutely no appeal to me. 
I am not the target audience. And so if you are the target audience, is this book of adventures? I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff scenario wise in it. So that's what they're marketing, right? With all the stretch goals as well. Is it worth twice the value of the base game? Used, used base game that you can buy. You can buy three of the core of the base game instead of buying the core plus the book of adventures and you and two of your friends could all have a copy of the core. That's what it actually illustrates. Um, then that's it. That's it. I can see why people were unhappy with this though. Like I said, I, I feel like the deluxification is, uh, adding awaken realms plus Robinson Crusoe. And that's kind of where we started at the beginning, right? I hope I'm missing something. I hope they add something else to make it more worthwhile. If you're interested, I mean, as with the Awaken Realms projects, uh, the daily unlocks maybe is going to increase the actual value that's being offered by the end of the campaign. So it might be worth just checking out in, you know, 17 or 18 days and seeing where things are at and seeing if the value is any better for you. Otherwise, I feel like people went into this kind of knowing what they were going to do or not. Uh, a lot of people liked it and said, I'm going to back it. And a lot of people said, you know what, this isn't for me. And the line was pretty well drawn. It'll be interesting to see sort of where they end up in terms of total amount raised. Uh, this is probably where I would have expected them after about two or three days. So will this sort of taper off or will this continue kind of to go up even though the stretch goals are just daily unlocks? I have no idea. No idea whatsoever. I could see this ending somewhere around a million euros, a million and a half euros or 750,000 euros just depending on how up and up and up that line goes. So there you go. Robinson Crusoe, collector's edition. So that's it. That is the roundup for this past week. A lot of stuff that I was just not expecting. A lot of stuff that is flying under the radar. A lot of more indie stuff that's just coming out of nowhere. A lot of card games, like I said. Trick-taking card games in general. Uh, both of those, uh, I just... I like seeing. Because I like those type of games. I'm slowly building in my collection. I think I'm going to actually have to put out a video here of of my thoughts either on some of the card games I have, a top five, a top ten, something like that that's in my collection. So, would that be of interest? I don't really know. Uh, some are Kickstarter, some are non-Kickstarter, some are Japanese imports, a little bit of everything. In case that wasn't clear, that's sort of what I'm like at this point. So, as always, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, tomorrow's video will be the upcoming for next week. A uh, little bit of everything as well for next week. And like I said, it's always interesting to see what pops up. So, Take that for what you will. And as always, thanks for doing whatever you're doing and the fact that you're watching this. So that means a lot to me as well. Have a great Friday. End of the week. Hopefully for you. Me too. Stay classy. See you around.